Let's go. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again for our series of educational webinars called Rose here at ResinTech. My name is David Chesnick. I'm the marketing director with me today once again, Peter Myers, our technical director, Frank De Silva, Oops. our Western Region sales manager, and Caitlin Clark, our ion exchange technologist. I'm assuming most of you know who ResinTech is, but for those of you who don't, uh, we're a US-based manufacturer of ion exchange resins based here in Camden, New Jersey, in this beautiful new building that you see before you. There's several companies under our umbrella that we're certainly, we're, we're currently in the process of bringing together under one to offer all these products and services from resins and activated carbon, specialty media, filter cartridges, lab systems, and so on. And of course, all the robust lab services, resin regen services and technical consulting and the like that you see on the right. So if you have any need for any of those types of products or services, feel free to reach out to any of your ResinTech, Aries Filterworks or ACM representatives and they're happy to, to help you. As far as today's presentation, uh, it's kind of part two of our introduction to ion exchange. Last, a couple of weeks ago, we did trace contaminants. Today, we are doing bulk contaminants. This is our second webinar of the day. And I'll ask you all to mute, mute your microphones. I think they're already muted. Uh, if you could kindly save your questions till the end, that'll give Peter the opportunity to move through his presentation. He's budgeted about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for question and answer. And since the group is a little smaller today, we'll probably be able to avail ourselves of the hand raising feature uh, and allow you to ask the questions directly. But if you'd like, you can always enter them in through the chat module within uh, the Zoom platform as well. And we're happy to, to bring them to Peter's attention at the end. Uh, the presentation will be available on our website and be available via YouTube at the conclusion, probably in a day or so. And as always, we, we welcome your feedback so that we can uh, refine our presentations and make them more and more valuable to you. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Peter Myers. Well, hi, everybody. You know, it's, it's different when you speak in public. You can judge your audience when you speak in a webinar, you're going out blind. You have no idea how any of what you're saying is being received. So after the last webinar, we got a lot of comments. And unfortunately, at least for me, not all of them were positive, but all of them were good. We took them to heart. And I hope that you will continue with this Tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. That way we'll make future webinars even better. By far the biggest use of ion exchange resin is water softening, followed by deionization, nitrate removal, potable water treatment, and a myriad of other applications. Most of these uses are what we call bulk ion removal rather than trace ion removal. We started out with the last webinar talking about trace ions. And one of the reasons I did it this way is because it's easier to look at the relationships for trace ions because they're driven pretty much by concentration. Bulk ions are a different story. The formulas are a little bit more complex and the interaction between the resin and the various ions in the water is definitely more complex. Just so you know, no ions were harmed in making this presentation, although a great number of electrons were inconvenienced. So this is the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about bulk ionic contaminants equivalents and equivalent concentrations. I'm going to introduce a selectivity equation and show some examples, but I'm not going to go through any of the math. If enough of you are interested in the math, we'll put a separate webinar on for that by itself. If you don't get anything else out of the selectivity equation, just remember it's products over reactants. We're gonna set the stage with a little bit more resin theory 
And then we're going to talk about three of the most common salt form bulk ion exchanges, hardness, nitrate, and alkalinity. So a little dad humor here, one tiny typo and bulk becomes Hulk. And moving right along, bulk ions. We're defining them as being greater than 1% of TDS. If you, if you took part in the previous webinar, you would know that we defined trace ions as less than 1%. The bulk ions are generally very soluble. They're not easily separated from each other and they're not really contaminants. They're the constituents, the salts that you typically find in almost every natural water supply. Even though they're not poisonous, we still need to take them out for sensitive processes like semiconductor manufacturing, boiler feed, drinking water. There was a question earlier today about what the bulk ions are. On the cation side, the four most common bulk ions are sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. That's by no means a complete list of the cations we find in water, but those are the most common and the most commonly reported. On the anion side, it's alkalinity, bicarbonates, chloride, sulfate, and nitrate. Again, that's not a complete list, but those are the ones we find all the time. I didn't mention silica because silica is not ionized at neutral pH. Therefore, it's not an ion. There's some fundamental differences between bulk ions and trace ions with respect to ion exchange resin. The bulk ions accumulate in the resin to much greater than 1%. And because the throughputs tend to be short because we're loading the resin up rather quickly. Uh, most bulk ion removals are associated with a regeneration process and the resin is cycled between exhaustion and regeneration hundreds or even thousands of times. Uh, this means that the regeneration cycle is every bit as important and perhaps more important than the exhaustion cycle. And with bulk ion removal, the water and the resin compositions change significantly from what they were to start with. Part two, ionic equivalence. We need to introduce Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That is what is defined as a mole. That would be a 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules or groups of atoms. In ion exchange, we're using it for equivalence. It's number of charges. Electrons are negatively charged. Ions that gain electrons are anions. In other words, they've robbed the electron from somebody else and ions that have lost electrons are cations. If you were lucky enough to sit through the first webinar, you would know that they are sometimes called Robbie. So equivalent weight is nothing more than molecular weight divided by valence or number of charges. And this is the way that we put all ion exchange on the basis of an equal number of charges. In water, Traditionally, we've used the calcium carbonate system of making an equivalent concentration. And the reason we used calcium carbonate is simple. It has a molecular weight of 100, its valence is two, it has an equivalent weight of 50. It's a very convenient number to multiply and divide by. And this goes back before we had computers and at that time, many calculations were either done by slide rule or they were done on paper. So being able to multiply and divide by 50 is very convenient. However, there's some problems with calcium carbonate. It doesn't handle certain types of relationships very well. The most classic one is a relationship between carbonate and bicarbonate. 
bicarbonate has a molecular weight of 61 and carbonate has a equivalent weight of 30. And this causes some problems in the calcium carbonate system. Anyway, because resins are reported in equivalents rather than milligrams per liter or milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate, we're going to be using the term milliequivalents throughout this presentation and future presentations. Uh, the conversion is very simple. 50 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate is equal to one milli equivalent per liter. It doesn't really matter what we use as long as they're equivalent and as long as we use the same units for all of the calculations. So one does not simply do equilibrium calculations without converting to equivalents. I believe that is Boromir from the Lord of the Rings, if you ever saw that movie. And Caitlin tells me he was also in Game of Thrones. Ionic equivalents. Capacity is measured as a matter of concentration. So they actually mean the same thing. Resin concentrations are expressed in equivalents per liter. A thousand mil milli equivalents is one equivalent. The formula is backwards, that's okay. And 21.8 kilograms is equal to one equivalent. That formula is also backwards. When we're talking about resin, <clears throat> the strong resins, Strong cation resin has an approximate concentration of about 2,000 milli equivalents per liter. Weak acid, a little bit close to double that. And the strong base and the weak base resins, a little less capacity, around 1,400 milli equivalents per liter. There's considerable variation from product to product and manufacturer to manufacturer due to cross-linking porosity and how the resin was made. This is the part where we present the selectivity equation. We'll be working with it in more detail in future webinars. Today, we're just going to present it and show a couple examples. I'm gonna talk about Le Chatelier's principle because it's relevant to ion exchange. Uh, neutralization reactions because they change the equilibrium and they defeat Le Chatelier. And the big picture, made up from many little pictures. So here's a formula. We've got screwed up again. The selectivity coefficient, K, with ion Y and valence A over ion X and valence B. So, Y is going into the resin, X is coming out of the resin. So if you remember, it's products over reactants. So we have ion Y coming out of the resin, going into, sorry, going into the resin. We have X coming, going into the water. The reactants were X, the form of the resin started with, and why the concentration of the ion in the solution. You'll notice these are binary equations. Nobody's ever solved elegantly the equation for more than two ions. Of course, most waters have many more than two ions. So in example one, I wanted to validate one of the important assumptions we used in the last webinar, and that is when you're dealing with a trace ion, the trace ion does not significantly change the resin composition 
or the water composition. In other words, the water remains essentially unchanged and so does the resin. And that assumption allows a simplification of the formulas. So here's the more complicated. This is the complete formula. This is an example of perchlorate against chloride and a type one strong base gel resin. The selectivity coefficient K is around 125. This varies with cross-linking and porosity. Total capacity about 1500 MeQ per liter. And for this exercise, we're starting out with the resin almost completely in the chloride form and a little bit of perchlorate in the water and a little bit of perchlorate in the resin. I also started with considerable chloride in the water. And the reason for doing that is if you're doing an equilibrium experiment with perchlorate because it's so selective, the resin just takes it all out. So once we've equilibrated, the resin is still almost completely in the chloride form and the chloride in the water has changed practically not at all. So the bulk composition of the resin and the water with respect to the trace have not changed. And that means that our assumption that we used to simplify the formula was valid. Le Chatelier was a French chemist and he developed the notion that any reversible chemical reaction, if you load one side of the equation, you get a change on the other side to, to try to stay in balance. And I tried to show this with a fulcrum. You know, if we have X on one side and X on the other, we're in balance. But if suddenly we add another X on one side, now we have two X on one side, that's going to tip the scale and unbalance the equation. Le Chatelier's principle says that we're then going to move some of this over to the other side of the equation to make things equal again. So here's an example of an unfavorable bulk exchange. And we're gonna talk a little later about alkalinity against chloride. The K, the selectivity coefficient is 0.25. So it's four to one against bicarbonate. Talking about SBG2, a type, one, a type two gel anion, total capacity about 1400. In this case, I started with the resin almost completely in the chloride form and the water almost 100% bicarbonate because bicarbonate is not preferred. The exchange is not complete, but we do get significant amount of capacity. It's roughly 10 kilograms if you're an old timer, 467 milli equivalents of the resin's capacity is taken up by bicarbonate. It's not great, but it's not horrible. Trying my fulcrum example, if we had a certain amount of chloride on one side and K was equal to one, meaning that bicarbonate and chloride had equal preference, then there would be the same amount of bicarbonate on the other side and everything would be in balance. But because K is 0.25, meaning chloride is four times stronger than bicarbonate, that unbalances the scale. And this is what causes the equilibrium to favor the bicarbonate going into the resin and chloride coming out. And the balance occurs with this example when there's 467 milli equivalents of chloride in the water and 933 milli equivalents of bicarbonate. Notice that the bicarbonate was not completely removed. And that is also characteristic of unfavorable selectivity coefficients. Now, Le Chatelier's principles apply 
so long as nothing is removing the products from the right side of the equation. And in this first example, we have a hydrogen formed cation reacting with sodium chloride in the water. The resin is taking up the sodium and releasing hydrogen. And hydrogen is building up on the right side and changing the equilibrium. But supposing we had sodium hydroxide instead of sodium chloride. Now the hydrogen formed cation, it's still reacting with the sodium, releasing the hydrogen, but hydrogen is going to neutralize the hydroxide and form that you know, very poisonous chemical dihydrogen monoxide, sometimes known as water. And water is molecular, and therefore that hydrogen ion no longer appears on the right side of the equation. As a consequence, the reaction moves to completion much more significantly than the previous example with sodium chloride. Okay, a little more ion exchange. I'm gonna talk about selectivity as a double-edged sword. The big picture, the ion exchange working zone and the importance of bed height. So why, is, why isn't a big K always a good thing? Well, it gives you higher throughput capacity and lower leakage with virgin resin, but it makes it harder to get that ion back off the resin during regeneration. A simple way of looking at it, if K is three to one, that's roughly the K factor for nitrate versus chloride. That means that the resin favors nitrate significantly in the exhaustion cycle. Unfortunately, it still favors nitrate significantly in the regeneration cycle, and all things being equal, it's going to take three chloride ions to knock one nitrate ion off the resin. So when we have ions with high selectivity and we need to regenerate them effectively and efficiently without using huge chemical doses. These are some of the ways that we can approach this double-edged sword problem. For instance, we could use chemicals, lots and lots of chemicals. For instance, if you were trying to get perchlorate off a type one strong base anion resin, you might be using a salt dose in the neighborhood of 200 pounds per cubic foot. Consider that we regenerate softeners at five or six pounds per cubic foot and nitrate units at 15 pounds a cubic foot to get perchlorate off of a strong base resin with sodium chloride is almost impossible. We can look for divalent to monovalent exchanges where the apparent selectivity changes. Water softeners are the classic example of this. It's an exchange that is favorable in the exhaustion cycle and in the regeneration cycle. We can look for intermediate regenerants and take advantage, again, take advantage of the divalent to monovalent. Uh, two examples would be bisulfate against chloride and hydroxide against sulfate. We can look at decomposing regenerants. For instance, ferric chloride forms the FeCl4 ferric chloride complex anion and is very selective against perchlorate even with the super perchlorate selective resins where the K value is in the 3000s or 4000s. The nice thing about ferric chloride is that complex anion only exists at high concentrations. So we can literally regenerate the resin with water. The ferric chloride complex decomposes and we can wash the ferric chloride back off the resin. Another opportunity would be the salt form of the weak resins. And this is, I think, overlooked by industry very often. 
The, the difference between weak resins and strong resins, the weak resins are only ionized at certain pHs. A weak acid cation is only ionized when the pH is greater than about five or six. And a weak base anion is only ionized when the pH is less than about eight or nine. Above or below, and the resin is actually molecular rather than ionic. But because it is molecular when it's regenerated, it's like a switch. Ions can't stick. It doesn't matter what the selectivity is because when it's molecular, it's no longer ion exchange and everything falls off. So we can use salt form exchanges with the weak resins to accomplish some separations that would be very difficult with the strong resins because the selectivities are so high. And of course, if we're lucky enough, we can look for neutralization reactions, which essentially drive ion exchange reactions to completion. The big picture. We're gonna be talking about binary equations. How many water supplies have only two ions in them? Almost none. Nobody's ever solved for three ions at a time, but we can do millions of two ion equilibrations and compile that into the bigger picture. If you take all of the water and all of the resin and you just dump it all together in a big pot and stir it. You get an equilibrium, but it's not efficient to do it that way. It's much more efficient to break up the equilibrium into smaller portions. And this is why fixed beds of ion exchange, this is why we put resin in a tank and we run the water down or up through the resin as a fixed bed, is so that we can take advantage of multiple equilibriums as the water and the resin interact. There's about 5,000 resin beads in one milliliter of resin. And every one of those beads is interacting with the water separately. So by doing millions of individual calculations, we can compile a bigger picture and that picture will include higher capacity and lower leakage. This is much better than a big stirred equilibrium. Same story in regeneration. You can't regenerate effectively by just putting the resin and mixing it with the chemical. It works, it just doesn't work very well. And of course, chromatographic programs like Resintex Mistex use the power of computers to solve these calculations. I was around at the start of all of this when the chromatographic programs were actually put onto a TI-59 programmable calculator. Uh, I still remember the days, in fact, I still have my slide rules when it was cool to have that slide rule on your hip clipped to your belt. So the big picture is assembled into a complete effluent profile. And we can run these profiles for any ionize any ion exchange where we know the constants for the resin and the water. Another important concept is that of the ion exchange working zone. So as the water's passing through this bed of resin, the top portion of the resin, assuming we're partly through the exhaustion, the top portion of the resin is exhausted. It's in equilibrium with the feed water. It's not exchanging ions. The working zone is the portion of the bed that is actively exchanging ions. And hopefully there's some unutilized resin at the bottom of the bed 
waiting to be used. Working zones tend to be between two and six inches thick for most bulk ion exchanges. It varies, it varies by flow rate, it varies by TDS, it varies by the type of ion, it varies by temperature, it varies by how good the liquid distributors are, what type of resin, how porous it is, but they do tend to, tend to be at least two and probably not more than six inches deep in most cases. Now that's not the same when you're doing polishing, that's different. Uh, working zones and polishers can be uh, maybe four to even 10 times deeper. And here's something that is sometimes hard for people to grasp. If the working zone's six inches, that's the part of the resin that you're not taking full utilization of. It's actively exchanging ions, the ions are starting to come out the back end of it. We normally stop an exhaustion cycle when leakage reaches a certain point. If that zone is six inches and the total bed depth is 24 inches, then we're losing 25% of our capacity due to the working zone. If we make the bed five feet deep, 60 inches deep, that six inch working zone is now only 10% of the total capacity. And we've picked up 15% throughput, 15% more water, simply by putting the resin in a taller, deeper tank. So why don't we go to 20 feet? Well, it turns out that there are practical limitations. There are pressure drop limitations these beads are plastic, we don't want them to crush, and deeper beds with higher pressure drops become increasingly susceptible to certain types of fouling, particularly plugging. So for most purposes, bed depths deeper than maybe six or seven feet require special techniques and an evaluation of whether the risk is worth the reward. I've seen beds as deep as 20 and 30 feet. It can be done, but there are risks. So salt form exchanges. We're gonna talk about hardness removal, also known as water softening nitrate removal and alkalinity removal. These are three of the most common salt form exchanges. So you go through some of the formulas, but not the math. So if we're looking at a cation resin, this is a gel cation resin. The K value, the selectivity coefficient for calcium against sodium is about 3.7. The K for magnesium against sodium is about one, maybe even a little less than one. And the capacity of a strong acid cation resin is roughly 2000 milli equivalents per liter. By the way, these capacities and K values that I'm presenting here, they are appropriate for ResinTech products there no guarantee that they're appropriate for anybody else's product. You would have to ask that manufacturer. So let's flash back to apparent selectivity. We talked a little bit about this in the trace contaminant seminar. Apparent selectivity changes with concentration for divalent to monovalent ions. And the reason is if, if you go back to the selectivity equation and you notice that there is a valence which gets squared in the selectivity calculation. And with divalent to monovalent ions, the higher the solution concentration, the less the resin prefers the divalent ion. If you're unsure, we have that previous lecture is up on YouTube, I believe. So the apparent selectivity, what I'm going to call AK for magnesium versus sodium, 
or, or any other pair of ions would be the K, the selectivity coefficient, times the resin concentration divided by the water concentration. So when we look at calcium versus sodium in a water softener, we can't just look at the K value. It's practically meaningless. We have to look at the apparent selectivity. At 100 part per million is calcium carbonate. That's two milli equivalents per liter. The apparent selectivity for calcium against sodium is about 3,700 to one. The resin prefers calcium by huge numbers. As TDS goes up, 1,000 ppm is calcium carbonate. The selectivity is dropped to 370. And at 100,000 ppm, 100,000 ppm is roughly 10% brine. The selectivity has dropped to 3.7. It still favors calcium, but it's a whole lot less unfavorable for sodium than it was at 100 ppm. When we look at magnesium versus sodium, the situation is even more pronounced. At 100 ppm, the resin likes magnesium over sodium by huge numbers. But in the 10% brine, the resin no longer prefers magnesium. And in fact, if we increase the brine concentration still further, selectivity reversal would occur and the resin would actually prefer sodium over magnesium. There aren't a whole lot of ion exchange reactions that are more efficient than water softening. And this is the fundamental reason why water softeners work so well. So they work and they work well, but only if the water TDS is relatively low. As that TDS goes up and the apparent selectivity drops, they don't work as well. And at some point, probably around 10,000 ppm as calcium carbonate, softeners are no longer a viable, economically viable way to take hardness out of water. Uh, 10,000 ppm TDS would be about 4,000 part per million sodium as sodium. So softening is a classic example of an equilibrium process that's efficient in both sides of the equation. Hardness, apparent selectivity is very favorable, provided the TDS is relatively low. The high brine concentration during regeneration greatly reduces the apparent selectivity. If you ever wondered why all the resin manufacturers say you've got to have minimum 8% brine, actually even higher brine concentration is better. And the reason is we need that high concentration to change the apparent selectivity, to change that relationship between divalent and monovalent ions. In a water softener, chemical efficiency can exceed 90%. That would be 5,500 grains per pound of salt. I've seen it done. Packed bed, low chemical dose, good distributors, 90% efficiency is not out of the question. Nitrate. So an example of a bulk exchange where selectivity matters, but sulfate is king. And we talk about nitrate selective resins, but the funny part of it is, if we look at, look at SPG2 versus SIR100, and SIR100 is resin text nitrate selective resin, the selectivity for nitrate only went up by about 60% from three to five. So it's only somewhat more nitrate selective. But if you look at the selectivity for sulfate, it went from 0.15 to 0.02. It got seven times lower. So nitrate selectivity went up by 60% and sulfate selectivity went down by seven times, almost an order of magnitude. And so, 
the nitrate selective resins really aren't so much nitrate selective as they are sulfate deselective. We also have the super nitrate selective resin, SIR110. K value for nitrate is even higher. Now, if you remember, a high K is not always a good thing. The selectivity for nitrate over chloride is 23. That means you're going to need 23 chloride ions on average to drop one nitrate ion off the resin. So when we regenerate this type of resin, the salt doses tend to be at least 20 or 30 pounds per cubic foot, much higher than a water softener. Notice that the sulfate selectivity has again dropped by a factor of about seven. The other thing you might notice is that the capacity has gone down. The bulkier amine, you can't get as many exchange groups into a certain volume of plastic. So the capacity goes down, the selectivity goes up. So we're going to do a couple binary calculations. Nitrate versus chloride. Now nitrate's monovalent, chloride's monovalent. Apparent selectivity and selectivity coefficient are the same thing. It doesn't matter, 100 ppm, 1,000 ppm, 10,000 ppm, the K value remains the same. With respect to sulfate, there's a big change. As the TDS goes up, if you look at SPG2 at 100 ppm, it prefers sulfate over nitrate by big numbers. If you look at 10,000 ppm, it no longer prefers sulfate over nitrate. And indeed, selectivity reversal will occur if you go above about 10,000 ppm. Look at the difference. If you look at the top left, we have a resin that prefers sulfate over nitrate by 100 to 1. And if you look at the bottom right, we have a resin that prefers nitrate over sulfate by a thousand to one, or, or doesn't prefer sulfate by a thousand to one, if you want to look at it that way. So when we're trying to decide which of these resin is most appropriate, we have to look at all of the choices. SBG2 is easier to regenerate, but because it's sulfate selective, you have to take the sulfate out to get the nitrate out. And if you run too far, you're going to dump the nitrate back into the water. If you look at SIR 110, it'll take nitrate out of just about anything, but you're gonna pay a penalty in terms of regeneration. You're gonna use much more salt. So if we put this all together, with nitrate against sulfate. Now, because we're doing binary equations and chloride is our reference ion, we can't do a calculation directly for nitrate versus sulfate. What we have to do is we have to do the chloride, the nitrate to chloride with the sulfate to chloride, and then ratio the two to get the nitrate to sulfate. So SBG2, Again, nitrate versus sulfate, it doesn't like nitrate. SIR110 loves nitrate, doesn't like sulfate. Okay, so nitrate is not nearly as, as effective as softening. You get substantial nitrate leakage because you don't get it all off and you don't get nearly the same chemical efficiency. Alkalinity, this is our last example. K values unfavorable. This picture, these are the softeners. These are the dealkalizers in the background. The dealkalizers are much larger because the capacity is lower. Go through the same example, bicarbonate versus chloride, doesn't change. 
apparent selectivity is the same as the selectivity coefficient. When we look at sulfate, there's a big change because it's a divalent to monovalent relationship. Low concentrations of resin greatly favor sulfate. So when we put it all together, bicarbonate against sulfate, this resin does not like bicarbonate compared to sulfate. But it's good enough. It works. We get reasonable capacities. It's not good for waters with lots of sulfate. And because it's an unfavorable exchange, you're going to always have some alkalinity leakage. So wrapping up, it's all about equivalence. One charge goes in, another comes out. Products over reactants. Le Chatelier is defeated if one of the products gets neutralized, and that's a good thing. Apparent selectivity changes with TDS, but only for divalent to monovalent exchanges. Selectivity is a double-edged sword. Bed height matters, and ions in the middle dump. We'll leave this slide up for a minute so that you can hopefully give me good feedback. Tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like. Tell us what other webinars you would like us to put on. We're happy to put on anything that people are interested in. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to put them together, so you're not gonna get everything in the next two weeks. Our next webinar is on nitrates. We're gonna take a deeper dive. Uh, Caitlin is going to present this and we're gonna talk about nitrate in detail, how to size a system, what the implications are, how, how to estimate capacities, and it should be, should be useful to anybody who is designing nitrate removal systems. And without any further ado, I'm ready for questions. Thanks, Peter. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand using the toolbar within the Zoom application or uh, send us a question using the Q&A module, either one, and Caitlin will uh, try to triage these and get them over to Peter. What you got? Peter, uh, go ahead. Oh, Peter, I'd like to report one of the questions from this morning. Uh, and that one was uh, concerning the ideal uh, bed height to tank diameter ratio. Yes, you would you would like you would like to have a big L over D if you can get it, but you can't because bed depths are limited to maybe ten feet at the maximum, and tank sizes go all the way up to twelve and fourteen, sixteen foot diameter. Uh, in some cases, you can't even get one-to-one, -one. but when you can, you would prefer to be an L over D of two or three or four, if you can get it. Deeper beds are always more efficient and produce lower leakage, and they're also less expensive to fabricate. Dave, did you raise your hand? Who raised her hand? No, I'm sorry about that. That was uh, Dave. Is that error, unfortunately. Does anybody have any questions for Peter while we have him? As he said, our uh, our next webinar is going to be on the 31st of March, um, and I think we have it scheduled for 11 o'clock. Is that right, Caitlin? Um, yes. That's currently what it's scheduled at. 11 a.m. And Caitlin will be presenting that, and we'll do a nice deep dive on nitrates. Feel free to send us some questions in advance of that presentation. If you'd like, you can reach us at webinars at resintech.com, and we'll try to weave in, uh, make sure that the, that the presentation is poised and, and can answer those questions in advance. So if no one has any other questions, I'm happy to give you the last five minutes back. I'm sure everybody would would love that. We appreciate you uh, joining us this this week.
And hopefully we'll get to see you all on the 31st of March. We'll send out uh, an invitation and I hope you all register. Thanks so much for joining us today. Peter, and thank you very thank you much. Thank you for listening to me. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.